Well, there was one last question that we didn't quite get to last time, and we need to pick it up today. And that is, what has love got to do with marriage? And if you'll notice, that is significantly absent in the anthropology textbook. So we'd have to ask that question, what has love got to do with marriage? And I would like to make a fairly broad statement here. Prior to the relatively recent modern era, love has had little to no place in determining who marries whom. Now, I want to qualify that a little bit because I am personally convinced, and I've got to be very careful about this because you know I've got I've got a whole building of theologians behind us here, and and the, you know some of them are liable to take me on, uh, but I am convinced in my own mind that the Song of Solomon is really uh, a play, you know, song and dance program in which um, the, the author and the chorus and everything else is associated with this production are advocating romantic love in marriage. So romantic love goes a long way back. Uh, but in point of fact, most marriages in most cultures were arranged marriages. Uh, they were marriages that parents would put together and, uh, and they were contracts, basically. Uh, they were contracts in which they would bring a man and a woman together and through their union uh, be able to create some kind of a stable family unit that would be productive for the next generation and that would create the most advantageous setting for a stable marriage. Now, uh, we had a, a, a missionary that uh, graduated from our MA program um, a, several months ago, and uh, he had actually graduated from Biola with a BA way back uh, years ago. Uh, his parents were missionaries in India, and he uh, went back to India as a missionary, and uh, he was, uh, you know, looking for a wife. And... Um, his father went with him to, uh, or went with a, another uh, Indian pastor. They went to a conference together, and both of them were at the conference. And the missionary said, oh, I wish I could find a really good wife for my son. And the Indian pastor said, oh, I wish I could find a really good man, husband for my daughter. And all of a sudden the lights went on and they said, what do you think, you know? Should my daughter marry your son? And the missionary said, you know, that sounds kind of good to me. So they went back to their respective homes and the missionary said to his son, son, I have found a good woman for you to be your wife. Would you be willing to, if I set up the arrangements, marry so-and-so's daughter? And the son said, yeah, I think that'd work. And uh, so half of the deal is done. The Indian pastor went back and he said to his wife and his daughter, I have found a husband for our daughter. And she was so delighted. And she said, who, daddy? And he said, a white guy. So-and-so son. Ooh, I mean, she's all in tears. I don't want to marry any smelly white man. And she goes running off to her room. And uh, she wasn't at all happy about this marriage. But she's a good Indian daughter. So um, she finally said, okay, daddy, if you think this is best for me, I'll even marry an American. So the arrangements were made, uh, the wedding took place, and uh, here was this missionary man back here finishing off his MA degree, and we were sitting at the graduation dinner together. He was there with his Indian wife and their uh, three daughters. 
and their delightful daughters. Uh, and they weren't too happy with um, the food that uh, Bon Appetit was serving that night. Uh, it was not Indian food and it wasn't food that they were used to. And I could see that they were kind of choking on it. So I said, hey, kids, would you rather have pizza? <laughs> oh, we'd love pizza. I said, done. So I got up, walked into the uh, cafeteria there, scooped up several slices of pizza, came back, handed it to them. Oh, they're in, they were in heaven. And uh, so then I started talking to mother and listened to her tell the story about how she did not want to marry this American. And I said, but you did. She said, of course, I am a good Indian daughter. My parents set it up. I agreed to it. I said, well, aren't you sorry that you did? Oh, she says, no. She says, I've really come to love him. You see, that's what was expected. That the parents would set up a marriage in which love could grow. Have any of you ever seen that, that, that movie, uh, Fiddler on the Roof? You remember the scene where he's sitting in bed and he's trying to figure out about his daughter who wants to get married for love. And she's convinced her dad that it's okay to get married for love, not by an arranged marriage. And so he turns to his wife and he says, do you love me? Do you remember the scene? Half of you don't even know what I'm talking about. All right. Friday night, Saturday night, no date, you know. You're bored out of your mind. You don't know what to do, no place to go. You go rent a movie and you watch Fiddler on the Roof. It is a great film. You will love it. About a Jewish man, Eastern Europe, three daughters. Each one of them presents their own special challenge. Daughter number two wants to marry for romance. So the husband turns to his wife and says, do you love me? She says, what kind of a silly question is that? You know, I cook your food. I wash your clothes. I clean the house. What do you mean, do I love you? What more evidence do you need? And he says, no, no, no. Do you love me? And it's a, it, it's, 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 it's a surprise to her. She doesn't know how to answer this. What does that mean? Well, that's what it's been like in so many marriages around the world. So uh, quite frankly, love as the basis for establishing stable marriages is a myth that has yet to be proved as fact. Isn't that a horrible statement? Now, um, I don't know how many of you listened to the news last night. The Kardashians have had a crisis in their family. <laughs> Ah, you do listen to the news. After, what is it, 72 days, they're getting divorced. Oh, I thought it would be forever. But 72 days is all I could take of this guy. And they're getting a divorce. 72 days. And uh, one, of the, one of the news commentators said, this is making a mockery of the whole institution of marriage. Well... What is a good basis for marriage? Well, we have yet to figure that out and your generation is going to have to figure it out. You see, because now you don't have to stay married as my parents' generation had to for economic reasons. Divorce is easy. The question is, can you stick it out? We'll have to see. Well, uh, we need to go on to another question. And our question now is, how many wives should a man have? You see, if, <clears throat> if having a wife is a good thing, having two wives ought to be a great thing, don't you think? Whoa, I am so happy. I think I'm going to take two, maybe three. Hey, maybe I'll become a Muslim and have seven. 
if one wife is good, is having more than one wife a great thing? That's a question I think we need to ask. Because, you see, polygyny, remember what we said polygyny was? Polygyny is the practice of taking more than one wife. It is found in three quarters of the world's cultures. Now, if it's such a bad idea, why are guys doing it? Why are cultures permitting it, encouraging it, based around it. Let me make a couple of observations about polygyny as it's found around the globe. First of all, not every man gets to have all of the wives he wants. Only the most qualified men can have more than one wife. In some cultures, as a matter of fact, probably in most cultures, only one in four or five men are able to have more than one wife. You see, if a guy's a loser, women aren't going to be attracted to him. But if he's a winner, then perhaps a second wife would find a nice stable environment in which to have children and live in a secure environment. Because in most societies, women want stable unions, not exclusive. Now you notice I said, most. Most societies want stable unions, not exclusive. Now, I don't believe that applies to you. I believe that almost everybody in this room wants an exclusive relationship with their man. Is that a, is that a lot legitimate? Okay. Okay, so stable versus exclusive. So let me ask you this question. What about introducing polygamy into the United States? Now, some people have suggested this, you know, sociologists and the like. As a matter of fact, let me, uh, let me read you a quote from the New York uh, uh, Times. About 40% of women who divorced recently while in their 30s will never remarry. Nor will about 70% of women who divorce when older than 40. According to the projections of a new study presented at the annual meeting of the American Sociological Association. So, women typically get married in their 20s, married for maybe 10, 12, 15 years, and then in their 30s, the marriage begins to crumble, fall apart. Maybe it's been crumbling, falling apart all along, but they get a divorce. For some, it is in their 40s. So, uh, this raises an interesting question. If a 40-year-old man divorces his wife and he gets remarried, is he going to remarry somebody, another woman at four, who's 40? No. no. Who's he going to marry? Well, the standard rule, standard rules are always not standard, but anyway, standard rule is that when a man remarries, he'll marry a woman who is half his age plus 10 years. So a 40 year old is going to marry a 30 year old. A 30 year old is going to marry a, uh, you know, 25 year old. They're going to marry younger. You know what that means? That means that women in their, let's say 42. They're 42 years of age and they want to get remarried because their husbands just walked out on them for a younger woman. And what's the age pool out there for her? All of the men her age are looking for cutie pies who are half their age. So she has the option of marrying a 60-year-old. That's not very appetizing. Or 70% of them will never get remarried. Now that is tragic. Because these are women who are in their most productive years. They're in the prime of life. I know, at your age, 40-year-olds seem to be, you know, you know, ancient. But it's actually, you know, their most productive middle years. 
and they've got nobody to share it with, nobody to help them walk it through, nobody to be uh, uh, a father to their children, apart from the scallywag that ran off. Uh, this is a tragedy, and they are doomed, I use that word carefully, they are doomed to singleness. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be nice if they could marry another guy who's already married and become a second wife? If she were a second wife, there'd be, uh, she, her children would have an, a father to take care of the kids. See? She wouldn't have all of the problems of a single parent trying to raise kids on her own, the economic disadvantages, the emotional disadvantages the kids that have a happier environment, she'd have somebody that she could come home to. I mean, I was even thinking about this in my family, you know? I mean, I mean, my wife, school teacher, she comes home, she's tired, she's exhausted, doesn't feel like cooking supper, doesn't want to do the laundry, but if there was another woman in the house, you know? <laughs> wife number one could have come home from school, supper's ready, laundry's done. All she's got to do is, you know, share her bed at night. Every other night, I don't know what we'd work out, you know. I never really talked it through with my wife. Here's a minute, Arthur, give me a chance to, to uh, build my case here. Um, wouldn't that be a good idea? I mean, here's your option. Okay, let me throw this. Here's your option. Your option is to marry a Biola Bob. You know, loser. <laughs> Untested, untried, immature, boring. Or marrying one of the younger rising professors over at Talbot. Solid, stable guy, proven track record, you know. Uh, wouldn't it be cool to be the second wife to a Talbot professor? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Well, because it's so new, I know. Well, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. Three quarters of the world's cultures have suggested that Polygyny is a good idea. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to argue that polygyny is a better solution to the marriage problem than monogamy. Okay? I'm going to give you half a dozen reasons why I believe polygyny is better than monogamy. And then I want you to argue me out of it. Okay? Can you do that? Take note of my arguments and then argue me out of it. Let me give you my reasoning. Okay, here's what I'm going to call a functionalist defense for polygyny. First of all, polygyny enhances reproductive success. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me look at it. Let's look at Willie Wimpy or Wimpy Willie. I don't care how you call him. A wimpy willy. I mean, this is the quintessential nerd. You know, he's uh, thin as a rail. He's socially inept. Um, he's not very desirable. Um, but ultimately, uh, some gal gets to marry him uh, and it turns out that he is unable to bear offspring. So he throws blanks. That's what the X's stand for. <laughs> no kids. Or else he marries a woman who's been rejected by everybody else because nobody else wants the woman. And she's been rejected by other men because she's sterile. Whatever the case, this wimpy willy doesn't get to have any children for the next generation. Let's take on Macho Mike. Okay, Macho Mike is sort of the Arnold Schwarzenegger of culture. You know, 
the guy who likes to pump iron. Have you seen pictures of Schwarzenegger during his weight building years, you know? How many of you gals really get turned on to muscle-bound, steroid-fed guys? How many of you really like that? Ah! Ah! Oh, come on, I can suck it up. How many of you really go for that? How many of you really like to see those muscles popping, the veins, you know, with the blood cursing down them as they... You know, I mean, doesn't that just turn you right on? Well, uh, I kind of get the feeling from the giggles that it doesn't turn you on. So why do guys do muscle building? Why do they want to build up these huge, enormous bodies? What is it about guys that make them want to be super builds? Hmm? If it's not for you women, who's it for? It's for guys. They're doing it for guys. They're doing it because the guys are all going to say, oh man, look at that guy. I wish I was like that. You really? I mean, I know I've got skinny little arms. That's why I wear long sleeve shirts, you know? Uh, you know, I'd even get a, uh, you know, a Jerry Seinfeld puffy shirt, you know, to kind of cover up my little skinny arms. Uh, but, but I don't know if I want to look like Arnie. You know. Well, anyway, here's Arnie, and he's taking, uh, he's taking steroids, and, uh, and uh, uh, quite frankly, he's a man's man. Um, there's just one little problem, you know, when it comes time to, you know, doing it in bed, uh, he's got some problems, see. Um, and, uh, you know, too many steroids have kind of affected the old sperm count, et cetera, et cetera. But in any case, Macho Mike, if he doesn't die prematurely and if he doesn't, uh, doesn't ruin his uh, sperm bank, uh, may end up with a daughter, you know? Now, daughters are wonderful. I love them daughters, you know? Got one myself. Didn't even, you know, didn't even send her away or be nasty. I mean, we, you know, my daughter and I, we have close relationships. So here's Macho Mike. He's got a daughter. Now comes normal Norm. All right. He's the average run-of-the-mill kind of a guy. He's industrious. He's fairly bright. He's very productive. He works for the well-being of the community. He takes his family and puts it in the center of his relationship. And Norm gets himself a wife takes good care of her, and has a normal-sized family, son and a daughter. But because he's such a delightful man, so attractive, another woman says, hey, I want to be married to a guy like that. I'm willing to be wife number two. Why are you laughing? Are you tickling her? Keep an eye. Okay, so he takes a second wife and have another son and a daughter. Now, do you see what's happening here for the next generation? Genetic selection is taking its course. The, the undesirable genes are being factored out. The macho guys who are really weird anomalies are being limited, but the normal, average, ordinary Joe who works for the well-being of the community, he's got the most kids into the next generation. His genes will dominate the next generation. And we saw this in Donnie culture. The most successful families, the ones that had the best social uh, power, the ones who took the best care of society, the ones who brought the greatest amount of leadership were children from large families where there were multiple wives, where they had already had a pattern of established 
social responsibility. You see, having more than one wife is a reward for social achievers. So, reproductive success is one of the advantages of polygyny. It rewards the most capable people. You see, guys really do enjoy having women in their lives, being loved and adored and appreciated. And the reward for a productive man is the ability to take another wife, to have two wives. So capable men. You know, sometimes you don't want more money. Sometimes you don't want more power. Sometimes you just want more appreciation. And what better way to get it than in the intimate relationship with someone who loves you and adores you and shares her life with you and with your other wives. So, it also reduces the onerous workload. You see, now if you've got two women taking care of one guy, it's not nearly as hard. For the woman, she doesn't have to produce as much food. She's got another woman that can help. She's got somebody that can help with the babysitting. I mean, this is why I do it for my wife, you know, so that she could have another woman around to help pick up some of the duties of a busy family. Now, I'm going to have to talk to my wife about this one. <laughs> Although it probably doesn't apply anymore since she's retired now and doesn't have to go to work. I probably missed my opportunity here. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> You know, it fosters social harmony, see? Because the more, f the more people who are members of your immediate family, the more you've got to develop social networks, the more you've got to take care of your in-laws or your cousins or your nephews or your nieces. And you've got this larger circle of people for whom you have some kind of social and economic responsibility. Um, We've got, we've got a, uh, uh, a guy here at Biola who is on our uh, security force, comes from Africa. He's got 12 brothers. He's got three mothers. You know, they all took care of one another. Nobody ever went hungry. Mother got sick, couldn't fix supper, that's okay. I got two other mothers who'll fix supper. Uh, Everybody could kind of build for solid families. And probably the most important of all, it ensures that all women will get a husband. Now, I'm kind of assuming that you women want a husband. A system of polygyny guarantees that you can get married. There will be no shortage of men. We just double up a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> you get divorced in your 30s or 40s, nothing to worry about. We've got guys who are becoming financially secure. I mean, hey, Justin Bieber, $55 million, what's he gonna do with all of that money? Spread it around three or four women. You know what? Sounds good to me. He's young, huh? Why are you shaking your head? No, no, no. How many of you would not? Well, no, let's not go there. Okay. Um, it's a broader economic base for the family because you've got more people producing. This is particularly true in agricultural cult, uh, societies. You've got more people who can grow food, who can take care of the family farm, and who can build a stronger economic base. As a matter of fact, one wife can go out and, uh, and work in the garden. The other one can stay home and make baskets or blankets and sell them in the marketplace. You can really up your productivity. And in some cultures, it may actually cement political alliances. It forces cultures to start getting along with one another. You know, I mean, even the English and the French married 
English kings with French princesses so that they could live in peaceful alliance. It may cement political alliances to have more of these cross-cultural multiple marriages. And a final argument, it may actually facilitate your children's marriages because so many cultures of the world have what we call endogamous cousin marriage, where you cannot marry anybody closer than a second cousin, and it has to be a second cousin uh, removed from another clan. And if you've got two wives or three wives, that means you got double or triple the number of cousins that you could draw upon as wives or as husbands for your children. You're doing a favor to your kids, making more desirable women available to you. You see, uh, polygyny is not that bad an idea. It's got all kinds of advantages. So I ask you, why are you women so selfish as to insist on a man all for yourself that nobody else can enjoy. <laughs> ah, I've thrown down the gauntlet. <laughs> Is it a matter of selfishness that you do not want to share your man with somebody else? Let's go here first. I don't know, like the big thing when I think about it is marriage is supposed to be a picture of God's love for the church. Uh-huh. And God, like, he's holy, committed to a wife. Like, the church is the like his one church, the body of Christ, you know? So I think like that makes, with like the picture of that and the representation of that, that's like kind of where I would draw off a bit too, you know? Okay, now let me repeat what she said because I want you all to get this, a very important picture. She said marriage is a representation of God's commitment and love for the church, right? Isn't that a beautiful picture? But you know what it also means? God no longer loves Israel. Because Israel's not the church. Eh, Israel, you're out. You know, I've cast you off. Or is it possible? Wait, 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 wait. Is it possible that God loves both Israel and the church? Like a polygamous or polygynous man? As a matter of fact, the, Bible, the Old Testament even talks about God as being in love with both Israel and Judah as two sisters, almost a sororal marriage situation. So the picture is wonderful, I love it. But I could also argue for a polygynous relationship as being ideally illustrative of God's love for Israel and the church. Okay. A couple of things, sure. wise. First of all, STDs would proliferate because one wife has it, the husband gets it, spreads it to the wives, spreads it to the kids. Lethal STDs would kill a lot of people. Uh. <laughs> I don't know what textbooks you've been reading, but, but r relationships in which three people are faithful to one another, there's going to be no more prolific than just simply between one man and one woman. It's only as they start <laughs> falling around that STDs will get into, will get into the relationship. Stable, stable multiple marriages does not have to result in more. If one of the wives takes a wife who has one. Oh, well, you know what, and that's, a, that's Obviously, if you, if you make that choice, you're going to have to make some careful choices here. Uh, either she needs some treatment, <laughs> uh, or you probably shouldn't do that in, out of love for your first wife. Do you, uh -huh. would, would, would you women be willing to help out with the household duties if there were two wives, or would you fight? <laughs> she says we'd fight, we'd fight. That's the problem. Why would you fight with another woman? Is there something the matter with you? Selfish, ingrate? D, 
demanding? High maintenance woman right here. High maintenance. You know, you know what? You know what? This is one of the great arguments that comes, oh, you'll have a lot more family conflict. Wives will fight. Well, why will they fight? If you are truly Christian, you will want the best for your sister, especially if she's your husband's wife. You will want the best for her. You won't fight with her. You will work for her well-being. And he will love you both, just like, just like Samuel's father loved both of his wives. Do you know what the fighting is in the Old Testament between wives? What's the fighting over? The inheritance that's going to go to the children. It's the inheritance that they fight over. See? And good prenuptial agreements can solve all of that. You know? I mean, we, we can get beyond that easily, no problem. Now, you know what? In, in certain parts of West Africa, women will nag their husbands into taking a second wife. They will say things like, if you really love me, you take another wife to help me out. Oh, I don't want, I just love you all. Oh. Don't be such a schmuck, you know? Give me a second wife. Okay, okay, I'll do it. I don't know who to marry. I've already picked her out. Yeah. Okay. Is the second wife um, only for convenience? Only for convenience. Yeah, for like to share the workload and things like that. You know, like uh, okay, I hope you were going to spell that out. Yeah. Well, you know, it's really for the fact that you are building a stable social setting for all three, the two women and the husband, to become all that they can be. I think it's a fulfillment of God's desires for them. Multiply and reproduce. What better way than to have a couple of women working together to raise a large family? I mean, come on. I mean, I had a grandmother that had 14 kids. That's almost obscene. It wouldn't have been nice if she had had another wife around, you know, to kind of take care of some of those little brats. Then, if it was biblical, then how come God didn't give Adam to us? Oh, that's a very good question. Why didn't Adam then start it out with two wives? He only has so many ribs. Well, I can't tell you why God didn't do certain things. You know, I mean, I have to guess. And my guess would be that he didn't give Adam two wives because if he had, it would have sparked ethnic conflict. Oh, we are the children of Eve. We are the children of uh, Rebecca, or whatever we want to call a second wife. And that there would be this, this constant uh, conflict between the descendants of those two women. It's the kind of thing that we see with the descendants of Abraham where you have the Jewish nation coming out of Abraham, you also have the Arab nation coming out of Islam or coming out of Abraham. And the constant conflict between them, God was very, very wise in having just one woman so that we all have a common father and a common mother. Okay, question. Would tolerate cheating? Because if the guy just walked on on his wives and they found out, he'd be just like, Oh, this is just going to be another wife for me. Something. And there's a problem there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Honestly. Would it be okay for the, one of the wives to cheat on you? Cheat? Or have another husband? If you can have well, that's a silly idea. The whole point of this is to stabilize relationships. We're not talking about open marriage here. We're talking about committed relationships between one man, two women, committed to building their lives together. Different. Now, if you're worried about STDs, uh, okay, let's, oh boy. I, I, 
I try not to get carried away into too many things here, but let's take herpes, for instance. We do not have a cure for herpes. No. So uh, you're dating a young lady and she comes and says, hey, I got a, got a little confession to make. I've got herpes. Now, herpes can be controlled with medicine. You all know that. But you can't make it go away and it can flare up. All right? Uh, you got a choice. You can marry that person and be very, very careful about your intimacy so that it doesn't spread. Or you could choose just not even to have intimacy, just be emotionally bonded together. Uh, it doesn't mean that that you would reject them. Although many guys are going to say, "Hey, you know what? <laughs> I, you know, I don't want anybody that's got anything like uh, like a possibly infectious disease." So um, I'm not sure that I can I can say that that's a reason for not having polygyny. Um, with the genetics again, um, well, normal norm gets all the wives, so all the people start becoming more like normal norm. If some cataclysmic event comes up or some disease comes around that doesn't favor normal norm, then you're so selected into normal norm that you're going to have some issues. Um, and that would only work on a very, very small band. In point of fact, in point of fact, and you'll have to, you'll have to look into this, when you start looking at North American Indians coming across uh, probably across the Bering Strait down into America, you have multiple bands of Indians or indigenous people moving down in. These were small bands that ultimately created a whole variety of tribes in North America. And you can look at the facial structure, the bodily structure of these and you can trace them back to a very few progenitors of that particular tribe. Um, now, they may have certain kinds of genetic basis, but it wasn't sufficiently strong enough to make them vulnerable to death, with one exception. All of the North American and South American tribes had no immunity against European diseases. And when the Europeans came, they introduced chickenpox, smallpox, other poxes, and decimated the entire population. So it is possible. I won't say it's not possible, but uh, it has never been sufficiently powerful enough to be a mitigating force against polygyny. Well, let's take one more. Ah, I was waiting for that one. Thank you. Give him an A for today. Uh, okay. Oh, what? <laughs> well, from a Christian perspective, our time on earth is so short. And um, in 1 Corinthians, when Paul is saying, like, not to get married, he says that a person that's married is not just concerned with the with pleasing the Lord, but pleasing their wife. So if you have multiple wives, you're even less concerned with God. And I think that's why they say to um, okay to, to not for a, a pastor or whatever not to have multiple wives because he needs to be more focused on God. Okay, so um, we got a couple of arguments here. One, the two shall become one flesh, not the three shall become one flesh. See, and you are arguing that multiple wives huh, will overwhelm you with the concerns of this life and keep you from, you know, pursuit of uh, godliness. Uh, the two shall become one flesh. Can three become one in everything? And I think we have a fine example of that in the Trinity. God is perfect unity, three in one. Three in one. It can happen. Now, you raise an interesting question. You asked, said, there is a restriction on pastors. 
and the restriction on pastors is that they will be the husband of one wife. And your interpretation, if I'm I, and I want to represent you correctly here because, I mean, we're on camera. The whole world's going to watch this. Do you want to wave at the camera? <laughs> uh, that the restriction there was intended so that they could not only take care of their family, but they could also take care of the people of God. Pretty good argument. Is that what Paul meant? Or... Was Paul saying husband of one wife because that was the acceptable social norm in the Mediterranean at the time of the New Testament? Now, there's some interesting things here that we got to look at. Polygyny had pretty well died out in the Middle East at this time in the history of Mediterranean civilizations. What you had, of course, was, uh, was uh, the licentious, hedonistic culture of the Romans, where they had one wife, but they had multiple mistresses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it wasn't a real pretty picture. Um, why did God put the restriction on pastors? We can read into it a number of good uh, observations, and this is, this, is, this is at least one good observation. But if that's the conclusion we're going to come to, then if two wives are a distraction, no wives is even better. And is that what Paul wants us to do? Does Paul want us all to commit to the great commission and forego marriage. Is that God's ideal? And this would be the logical implications of where you're going. And you know what? I, mean, I shared with you the other day, I, you know, I said, hey, I decided I'm going to make, I'm going to check that option. And uh, God answered me by saying, you, know, you need too much help. Uh, you know, I got to sign some poor old gal to uh, come alongside and suffer alongside of you and shape you up. I went home and told my wife about that, by the way. She howled. She said, I'm an abysmal failure. I haven't done it, have I? Well, um, let's, let's change the tables now. Lest you all think I'm really a dirty old man uh, chasing after younger women for my second and third wives. Let's go to a functionalist defense of monogamy. Okay, I'll take off my devil's advocate hat and I'll put on my white wings and become angelic. Monogamy does encourage strong emotional bonds. I think that's what all of you are looking for. You're looking for somebody with whom you can become emotionally bonded, somebody that you can feel close to, someone whom uh, you can feel comfortable with. And there's no question but that there would be competition between wives. It can be minimized, but there is a certain sense of possessiveness that takes over. We had one poor guy, I say poor guy, he was a polygamist, he had two wives, and the, the wives kept track of one another. You slept with her last night, you gotta sleep with me tonight. And there was this constant, don't give her anything you don't give me. And uh, so he had to be very careful in how he balanced care of his two wives. And wouldn't you know it, both of them got pregnant within 24 hours of each other. Both of them gave birth to children within 24 hours. And he's got two kids uh, growing up in his household uh, that he now has to take care of. Um, well, it will also reduce competition between men. And you say, what? Yes. You see, because once a guy gets married, he's no longer competing with the available females with the other guys. He's out of the competition. We don't have to worry about him anymore. He's already got a wife. The rest of the available females 
are dateable for us. So guys can feel comfortable around married men assuming that they are not scallywags. Fourthly, monogamy is much less demanding economically in urban and in industrial societies. Quite frankly, the cost of two wives in our society is high, onerous, if you would. And uh, supporting one wife is probably all that any of us can handle. Well, what does the Bible have to say about monogamy? All right, let's take a look at, we, we've looked at the sociological functionalist analysis. Let's look at what the Bible has to say. First of all, the Bible never condemns polygamy or if you want polygyny. The Bible never condemns it. All right, as a matter of fact, God even blesses polygamous marriages. God does some marvelous things through men in their multiple relationships. Now the New Testament does advocate monogamy for church leaders. And we gotta try to figure out why. You see, because when I went to Erie and Jaya, we had one out of every four men, all of the best leaders in the culture were members of families with multiple wives. They had multiple wives. These are the ones that you want to be your church leaders. These are the ones that are the leaders in their community. These are the ones that have the respect of the community. And all of a sudden I got to say, oh no, you can't be leaders in the church. We're going to pick all these loser guys over here. Is that what we want? Well, as I was struggling my way through this, the Bible does not condemn polygynous relationships. The Bible does advocate monogamy for leaders. I came upon what I thought was a unique discovery until I got here to Biola and discovered that some of those wretched Talbot guys had stolen my idea without ever telling me. Well, actually, they didn't even know I'd come up with this, but you know what? It's what we call the one man, one woman principle. God's ideal appears to be one man, one woman. What does that mean? Well, let's, let's look at how I came to my conclusion. Let's look at the regulations on marriage and sexuality. For instance, promiscuity, premarital or otherwise, Uncommitted sex with people outside of marriage is spoken against in the scriptures. Promiscuity is almost always uncommitted love or relationships between people who have not been entered into a marriage relationship uh, with anyone. Then you have adultery. And adultery is where a married partner has sex with either another married partner, not their wife or husband, or outside of the marriage relationship. And adultery is condemned. Then you look at prostitution. Sex is not a recreational sport. All right? Sex is not something that you can put on the list of professional careers. Payment is not allowed. And then when it comes to divorce, this very interesting description about what happens if you do get married and then you get into divorce. What does the scripture say about what happens if you get a divorce? Can you go out and get remarried? What does it say? It says, no, do not get remarried. Now, we're not going to talk about the theology of marriage and divorce and remarriage. You know, come by and talk to me later, or talk to somebody over at Talbot, talk to some of the ethics people. That's another discussion. 
Divorce is spoken against. Now, the Bible is very pragmatic and the Bible recognizes that divorces will take place. As a matter of fact, Moses is even given permission to give bills of divorce to people whose marriages begin to break up. So can I go so far as to say divorce is God's answer, at least in Moses' time? Why? Because of sin. All right, we'll leave it at that. So what do I conclude from looking at all of these regulations on sexual behaviors? I come to the conclusion that it was God's intent that in a sexually bonded relationship, a man and a woman shall become one in spirit, in body, in purpose, and that this shall endure while they both live. All right? That this will endure while they both live. This is God's ideal. That you will have one sexual partner for life. Now, that raises an interesting question. What happens if you've already become sexually active? What happens if your marriage falls apart? I've been here long enough to know that a lot of Biola marriages fall apart. God's ideal is God's ideal. And we have to take into consideration God's grace and mercy. And what God does in a world that is marred by sin. And that's where we have to pick up the story in an entirely different format. So uh, you have not, you have not sidelined yourself for the best of God's desires for you. If somehow or another you can't have up to God's ideals, what has to happen is you must then come back to God and find grace and mercy and forgiveness and then restoration uh, uh, that will begin a whole new aspect of your life. Well, let's move on because there are a couple more things we really need to talk about. Marriage, marriage is one of the most unstable fragile relationships in every society. Men and women are in a constant state of tension in every culture. Women will up and leave their husbands. Women who cannot leave their husbands will commit suicide. It is a very difficult relationship to maintain over the years. So how do we strengthen the bonds of marriage. Every culture struggles to strengthen the social bonds that hold a couple together. One of the ways of doing that is what we call bride wealth payments. All right, what happens there? In bride wealth, you have the man paying the family of the bride and over half of the cultures of the world, the man's family will pay the woman's family a considerable amount of wealth in order to bring that woman over into their clan and to ensure that she is a good wife and mother to her husband and her husband's children. It is a way of stabilizing marriages. We also have what we call bride service. And in bride service, the man will work for the family of the bride. And you see this in the Old Testament, where Jacob has to work for years to pray the, pay the bride service. Ends up getting the elder daughter and has to work that many years again. And what does the Bible say about his years of bride service? What does it say? It was like it was never hard. It was like it passed quickly. Boy, that's real love. Okay. All right, well, that only happens in about 12.5% of the world's cultures. And then we have what we call dowry. Dowry takes place when a woman's share of her inheritance comes into the marriage and it helps her to start her new home as a new wife. 
And this takes place in 5% of the world's cultures. Now, if you are here and you're from a Northern European, English, Irish culture, we had a system of dowry. Have any of you ever seen that old John Wayne movie, The Quiet Man? Only one? Okay. Two? Okay. It's okay. I, I don't judge people for watching movies. It's, it's, a, it's a great movie, and I'd actually show a, a segment of it here, but, uh, but it really does advocate uh, a violence against women. I don't want to reinforce uh, that violence against women uh, motif that comes through in, in this movie. But uh, John Wayne is an American. He moves back to Ireland, and he wants to, uh, wants to uh, date a, uh, uh, an older woman uh, that's still single, and ultimately, uh, ultimately discovers that, that no man is willing to date her because her brother, who holds uh, the woman's inheritance, the dowry, has said that no man can marry his sister unless they have a fist fight. And he's such a brute of a guy that the thought of being pummeled into near oblivion uh, scares everybody off. But he goes ahead and starts it. And, um, and ultimately, uh, he... Uh, reneges, the brother reneges on the dowry. So uh, the new wife says, well, that's it. No more intimacies with you. You sleep outside. I'm not sleeping with you. So he grabs her and drags her across the heath and uh, flings her down in front of her brother and says, okay, it's your rules, your game. You don't pay the dowry. She's not my wife. And the brother realizes he's in trouble. So he comes out and he gives John Wayne the money that will complete the dowry. And what does John Wayne do with it? Do you remember? He turns around and he throws it in the fireplace and burns it all up. He did not want that. Well, that is such an insult to the brother that they have this huge little fistikin, and it turns out that John Wayne was a professional boxer in the United States, and uh, he could take the brother, oh, it's a great movie, if you love violence and, you know, dominance of men over women, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all that good stuff. But that was dowry. The dowry system was alive and well in the United States, and you have all kinds of stories about poor women who cannot get into a good marriage because they, their parents don't have any dowry to bring to the wedding. So men come and say, oh, yes, I'd like to, I'd like to court you. What kind of dowry are you bringing? Oh, I don't have any dowry. Eh, thanks anyway, I'll keep looking. See? Well, let's talk about bride wealth because it's been very misunderstood. It is not a system where you buy a wife. It is a system for strengthening social bonds. It is a way of encouraging faithfulness. And it does establish self-worth. Now, I read a dissertation on Donnie marriage practices written by a very competent anthropologist from another university. And one of the things that they came to the conclusion was these are all the reasons why they have bride wealth payments. So I took that list and I sat down with a group of Donnie men and I said, hey, here's what somebody said about marriage practices out here. And I started reading off all of these things that this anthropologist said. And the guys howled and hooted over how ridiculous these conclusions were. They said, those are not the reasons at all for which we have bride wealth. I said, what reasons do you have that? Why do you encourage it? And they said, it is a man's way of him and his family saying to the family of the girl, this woman is a beautiful woman, well-groomed well-trained. She is a prospective, beautiful bride and good mother. And we want to thank you 
We want to reward you for all of the effort you've put into raising her. By doing so, they, they establish her own sense of self-worth. The higher the bride will, the more valuable she felt. And when she got married, she felt obligated to be faithful to this man who held her in such high esteem. Now, we had an interesting situation because a number of our missionaries said, oh, bride wealth is terrible. We got to stop it. Christians should not have bride wealth. So some of the villages dropped bride wealth payment. So I said to them, well, I said, you guys have dropped bride wealth in some of your villages. What's been the result? They said, oh, our daughters feel terrible. They feel cheap, underappreciated, and they don't feel any particular emotional bonds to their husbands because they've never had to sacrifice for them. We're finding wives running out of their marriages more regularly if we don't have bride wealth. And I said, well, if that's the reason, you ought to keep it. What's the problem? And they said, oh, the problem is that we all get greedy during bride wealth payments. Everybody wants to add more payment so that they can get more for themselves. And I said, if that's the case, keep bride wealth, but insist that all of the bride wealth must be consumed in the marriage ceremony so that nobody gets rich off of it, but you can still praise your daughters and praise the families that raise the girls. And they said, of course, that's what we'll do. So we kept bride wealth as Christians. And we tried to overcome the problems with greediness. Well, the last one, it does legitimize the children. When the bride wealth is paid, then the child becomes then a member of the father's clan, not of the wife's clan. Well, the Bible does not advocate, condone, or condemn any cultural practices regarding how to take a spouse, so long as it is in harmony with the moral standards of godly living. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.